The Truth Can Get You Killed, a Paul Turner mystery. Author, Mark Richard Zubro, publisher, St. Martin's Press, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 19. As they stooped over the body, Fenwick said, Double and triple fuck. Can't argue with that, Turner said. The bullet had made a hole in the right side of Mike Mead's forehead. Blood and gore from the exit wound had splattered on the tiles in the shower. Blood covered the back of one hand. Turner guessed that the window was broken when his body was flung back with the force of the gunshot. Turner and Fenwick carefully walked away from the body. They'd wait for the arrival of the crime lab and M.E. people before they did anything, besides ascertaining that Mead was dead. From the entry, they observed the room. The couch was shoved up against the wall. Clothes from the closet were strewn about the room. The kitchen table was on its side. The lone chair was in the corner of the room nearest to the bathroom. Fight, Fenwick said. That's the thump in the neighborhood. She killed him? I have to ask. While they waited for the technicians to arrive, Turner and Fenwick interviewed the woman next door. Elmira Wiggins' apartment was as small as Mead's, but with a great deal more furniture. Turner would have called it Victorian Whorehouse, which he suspected may have been connected to her profession. The plush pink pillows, the red lighting, the bright orange carpeting were as much a giveaway as her cut-to-the-crotch, skin-tight leather skirt. Only a hooker wore in weather like this. Elmira was in her early twenties. She repeated her story. He was never here that much. I only hear him once in a while. I met him in the hall several times. Once I stopped over to discuss the way the management treats us. He seemed shy. I tried to be friendly, but he didn't respond. Turner wondered if she made an offer that a Mead could refuse. In the hallway, Turner said, She is not high on my suspect list. Definitely not a keeper, Fenwick said. I wonder if her name's really Elmira. They joined the technicians in the apartment. One of the men from the crime lab and a woman from the M.E.'s office stood with the two detectives in the middle of the room. Fight, shot, dead, was the guy from the crime lab's take on the matter. Sums it up, Fenwick said. Let's go home. Need to check the wound, Turner said. Match the bullet or what you can find of it with what you've got from his dad. Already on it. Blood on the hand caused from when it hit the window? You sure? Glass in the cuts. Only glass that's broken is the window. Probably hit it after he got shot. Reflex body thrown back on impact. Turner loved it when technicians confirmed his observations. A uniformed cop came in. Nobody else home on this floor. Nobody on the floor above or below heard anything. With the temperature up, lots of people are out getting groceries and stuff. Just after they took the body away, the technicians left. They returned to the bathroom. Cool in here, Turner said. Broken windows in January will do that, Fenwick commented. Turner touched the radiator. Feels kind of cool. Fenwick reached out to touch it. Wait! Turner said he noted the spots where paint flecked off and dust was scattered on it. Let's get the text back in here. I want this examined. If they struggled, the killer might have brushed against this. Or touched it inadvertently, Fenwick suggested. Or simply brushed up against it. The bathroom cabinet had a toothbrush, toothpaste, an electric razor, and a comb. The only drawers were the ones in the hallway, which doubled as a clothes closet. Turner and Fenwick opened them. One of them contained what would generously be called his outfits for dancing. Clean, neat, skimpy, and no clues to murder. Are these things all his? Fenwick asked. Presumably, Turner held up a fishnet g-string. I'd like to see Ben in something like this. Or Madge, Fenwick said. They finished their brief inspection and returned to the main room. I gotta ask the question of the hour, Fenwick said. I don't know, Turner said. I didn't ask. One killer or two? Well, the question isn't much more obvious than the sunrise, and I don't know the answer. I thought I'd save you the energy. 
your pal. Let's get to Mrs. Mead. This is not going to be pleasant. It was worse than they imagined. When they told Mrs. Mead, she collapsed on the floor and moaned. They helped her to a couch. Her daughter, Pam, entered the room. She hurried to her mother. What's wrong? she asked. Mrs. Mead continued moaning. Pam turned to the cops. What happened? They told her. Abruptly, she sat on the edge of the couch. She continued to pat her mother's hand absently. I don't believe it, she whispered. Uh, we're sorry, Turner said. She nodded. We need to look in his room, Turner said. She pointed to a hallway on the right. They eased out of the room and down the hall. The first door was a bathroom. The second, a bedroom. Got to be his, Fenwick asked. Turner gazed at the four posters of male sports stars on the walls. Baseball, basketball, hockey, football. All Caucasian males, all with poses that emphasize their crutches. Like Mead's parents weren't the only ones who missed the obvious. They inspected the room carefully. Under the right side of the mattress, they found two male pornographic magazines with several pages in each stuck together. At least he was normal, Turner said. How's that? He beat off. Fenwick inspected the closet while Turner started on the desk. These all his, Fenwick called. What? Turner joined him. Fenwick showed him the label on a pair of pants. I've got size 28 waist and 30 length on most of these, but I've got two with 30 inch waist and 34 length. The change in waist, I can see, Turner said. Not in length, not that much. He had a boyfriend staying the night here? I don't remember mentioning any boyfriends. You don't remember it because he didn't mention it. I want to know more about Mr. Boyfriend. Why wasn't this stuff at his place in Rogers Park? Why here? It isn't the usual practice for severely closeted gay men to entertain their lovers in their parents' house or for them to leave clothes behind. Maybe there's a logical, non-intimate explanation. I'm listening. I didn't say I had one. I just said there might be one. Turner returned to the desk. He found paper clips, pens, pencils, blank notebooks, college papers, a bank book, and a package of glow-in-the-dark condoms. I didn't know they made these, Turner said. What? Turner showed him they found nothing else that led to either an explanation for why father and son should be dead or any lead to who the boyfriend might be. We've got to talk to the mother and daughter, Turner said. Something is going on connected to them. They must know something. Pam was at her mother's side. She was crying softly and holding her mother's hand. Turner and Fenwick walked over to them. Please, Turner said, if you could answer a few questions. I phoned my mother's best friend. She'll be here any minute. My mom is not going to be able to talk. I don't know how I'm going to be able to talk. Mrs. Mead stared straight ahead. Her blinks seemed to come minutes apart and seemed to take hours to complete. She responded with silence to questions she did not move when touched. Turner suggested to Pam that she call the family doctor as well as the friend. She spent several minutes making calls. When the friend arrived, they managed to maneuver Mrs. Mead, so she was lying down on the couch. They left them and moved to the next room. When they were seated again, Pam said, I wish I could yell at you again as I did the other day. I don't know why I'm not screaming myself into insensibility. I love my brother. We were very close. She began to cry a large number of tissues later. She was composed enough to speak. I don't know what I could tell you. Your brother claimed you knew he was gay, Turner said. Yes, he told me last summer. We have a cottage in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. He and I were there for a week before our parents came up. We both brought boyfriends. Was he a lover or boyfriend? Or a casual acquaintance? More than a casual acquaintance, but maybe not a boyfriend. They slept in the same bed. But from what Mike said, I don't think they were in love. They certainly had a good time together. This was a guy named Frank. He might have met him at Dad's office. Francis Barlow? Turner asked. Tall hair, combed back, and greased down. Tall and slender enough to be a 30-inch waist, 34-inch length. 
Yes. At first I thought he might be kind of standoffish, but he turned out to be great. We listened to old Anna Russell albums or played silly board games. We laughed and had a great time. Did you know about Mike's apartment in Rogers Park? Mike had an apartment in Chicago? Mike Mead had obviously not told her everything. Yes, he wasn't living in Bloomington. Did he tell you he was a dancer at a strip bar and maybe making extra money on the side with the customers? She looked genuinely bewildered. Mike would never do anything like that. There would be too much danger in doing harm to Dad's career and to his own future for him to do something that stupid. How did he and your father get along? She hesitated. They waited. The hesitation told Turner and almost enough. Now that they're both... She stopped. I wouldn't have told you this if it was just my dad. I would never implicate Mike. He wouldn't have killed our dad. She sighed. They fought a lot. She sniffed and dabbed at her eyes with a tissue. They fought about politics, mostly. I think a lot of Mike's anger came from his being unable to be open about his sexuality. It got worse the last year or so. I would never have said anything to either of my parents about Mike's sexuality without Mike's permission. Mike wanted very badly to come out to Dad. His desire for his dad's approval was enormous. He spent his childhood trying to please him. I felt helpless. I do what I could to keep them apart here at home, which wasn't hard because Mike wasn't around that much. If other people were in the house, they were very civil to each other. I always seemed to have friends over. I could do other little things for Mike, like make sure he had a chance to be with his friend at the cabin. I've never seen Mike happier than that week last summer. He wanted to tell my dad about his sexuality this vacation. But with the DuPage County decision, it just didn't work out. They fought almost every time they saw each other. Fenwick said, Mike wanted his dad's approval, but they kept on fighting. Is that so odd? It was Mike's way of saying he'd grown up. And he was an independent person. My father was a very strong personality. They told her what Mike had said about him and his father's actions on New Year's Eve. I know nothing of this, she said. Mike said nothing to me. Was he really a stripper? Yes. She shook her head. Telling Mom all this is going to be hell. The doctor arrived after examining Mrs. Mead. He advised against sedating her. The friend agreed to stay as long as necessary. Turner and Fenwick left. Light snow had begun to fall as they made their way to the car. Momstead or Barlow? Turner asked. Which one's closer? I don't have the master list. Let's stop at Area 10 and get Barlow's address. We have to go through the loop to get to Momstead's anyway. At Area 10, the hallways were a bit less jammed. The warmer temperatures had allowed most of the locals to wander back to their inadequately heated homes or hovels. A much larger crowd of reporters had taken their place. Cameras from three local stations were present. The blonde cop who'd apologized. Jason O'Leary said, You both got a meeting in the commander's office. The superintendent is in with them. Turner and Fenwick trudged down the hall toward the commander's office in the rear of the building. Fenwick hummed the melody from the Grand March from Aida. I'm the one who's supposed to know opera. Why are you humming that? Some commercial was using it for a jingle. Carpets or hammerheads or something. I like the tune. You don't like opera anyway. How do you know what that tune is? My gay opera gene may be defective, but I know some of the basics. Dated an opera queen for two weeks at once. I even attended one at the end of two weeks. I disliked him more than I did the opera. They knocked at the commander's door. Neither the acting commander nor the superintendent smiled at them as they entered. Drew Moulton introduced the superintendent, then said, oh, We need an update on the Mead case. I filled the superintendent in on everything up to when you left this morning. The sun dying complicates everything. The media frenzy is going to be overwhelming. They gave them everything they'd done that day. They included the difficulties with the judges. I had calls on that. The superintendent said, one from Judge Wadsworth and one just before I left to come here from uh, Judge Wright. 
neither of them has any pool in the city that I'm aware of. So count yourself lucky. A Wadsworth was very angry. He thinks he's got clout. A good thing for you, he's not a criminal judge. I got an odd call from the FBI. Uh, they don't like you either, but none of us likes them, so I don't care. I haven't been a detective in a while. I understand your style. I understand your reputation. I understand your results. If you could be more gentle, I'd recommend it. What I need you to do is catch me a criminal. If they didn't, Turner figured they could be writing traffic tickets in Hedgewish for the rest of their careers. We're on our way to talk to Malmstead and Barlow. Have somebody bring the kid in, Moulton said. You can probably get Malmstead just as fast by going yourself. Getting the suburban cops to go out there and then sending somebody to get her is a pain in the ass. Just let them know you're coming. Always do, Fenwick said. They got Barlow's address and gave it to several uniforms so they could pick him up. If he's not home, stay there until he arrives, Fenwick ordered. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.